fine. So let's get into the reins here and talk about RCS, uh, that messy battle that we talked about on Friday, but apparently we have more developments since then. So Google has been this biggest proponent of RCS for the longest time, started with the acquisition of Jibe, which is where we get the name for the Jibe servers in 2015. And then we had a slow integration, Rogers and Canada got on board. And then there was the effort to offer Jibe servers as the interconnect for every carrier in 2017, at least those that supported the universal profile. And then all of a sudden, we had this wide swath of Android phones in France and the UK. They got RCS, didn't really matter which carrier it was. And then last week, of course, you heard this cross carrier messaging initiative, whatever it is, it's gonna be more elegant. That's the words that they used. So all that out of the way, Google, uh, beside the picture for those uh, the big four carriers as uh, we go along. Now it turns out uh, that users are looking to find a way to trigger the RCS uh, to make that happen in Google Messages. So the way that they have done that, and I've been talking a lot with uh, Max Weinbach of XDA over the weekend, had some nice pizza with him too, uh, is to download this app called Activity Launcher. And then you have to make some things happen with the latest beta of uh, Google Messages. I think it's 5.2 at this point. And then you check a few boxes. The article that we have on the site, which I shall post into the Twitch chat right about now, is uh, going to tell you everything that you need. But basically, that's all you need to do. Uh, I'm not sure about the total reliability of how long this uh, integration will last because uh, the I think the server it really redirects to is uh, Sandbox. Yeah, it, it has Sandbox in the URL, um, which is suspicious. But um, I mean, I, I kind of I wonder how uh, the URL for this got out there. Um, it, maybe it has something to do with Google's uh, previously announced initiative to roll out RCS in France and the UK. They did that. Uh, they ta talked about that first earlier this year, I think, as a way to sort of spur carriers uh, into action. But I mean, yeah, so I mean, I've, I did this on my phone. It worked and it has been working reliably all weekend. Um, it's, you know, it, it it's not uh, the easiest process. You have to basically paste the RCS server URL into this part of messages you can only get to with the activity launcher. And then you might have to like clear data on like your carrier services app. And, you know, it, it takes a couple of minutes, but it works pretty reliably, I think, for almost everybody. Um, well, for me, uh, actively launchers had the URL just in one of the drop uh, list things. Oh, and did I it? just have that. Yeah. I know. I, had to, I don't so even know. For me, like it had the, um, so it didn't have the URL. I had to like manually paste that in, but it did have the um the other field that you might have to put in if you're like uh i think the otp pattern like if if something isn't working yeah. correctly you could do that it had that but it didn't have the url but um i still got the same uh url for the uh sandbox server but uh, the fact that i was using sprint which is already on its own rcs uh you know thing going on helped and uh, that i got an instant connection as opposed to all the other cases where everyone else is going to Google's Jibe servers, and that took a little bit of time to uh, get everyone connected. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I think that if any, even if this uh, server goes away, if Google just sort of silently turns it off and pretends it never happened, uh, at least we know for a fact that if Google wanted to, it could just wave its magic wand and give everybody RCS messaging. Um, and the only reason for it to not do that is that it doesn't want to upset the carriers. Hmm. See, I'm not sure if we should be upsetting the carriers when they're making all of the 5Gs happening. Yeah. 
all that super <laughs> useful 5G. Um, so, I mean, like we talked about last week, carriers formed their new their new uh, sort of uh, coalition to set up RCS messaging next year, but they're going to launch their own app and their own uh, sort of their own uh, custom server implementation of uh, of RCS. So, I mean, it it just seems uh, like Google was cut out of the process, and I wouldn't be surprised if Google is just sort of going to say, well, I guess we'll just turn it on now since, you know, carriers decided not to work with us. That would be ideal for me, honestly. I don't want to have to I'm, deal with a weird carrier app for, for RCS. I'm a little surprised at the sentiment that we're seeing here on the Twitch chat room because they, they feel... Uh, um, I'm not sure what the right word for it, but it's, you know, it's not <laughs> neutral towards uh, RCS. They don't really feel like it's for the trouble. It's it's deserves the trouble to do. I it. mean, if you have to, I mean, if you have to like make all of your friends and family like paste in URLs and launch the, like you know this third party app to turn it on, yeah, that's not worth it. Agreed. But but if you know if Google just updated messages and everybody's RCS started working, yeah, that's a good thing. I mean, RCS is a much more powerful protocol than SMS. I mean, yeah. and if you ever try to like send people photos over MMS, you know how absolutely horrible it is. See, I mean, just seeing able think. to send large files in RCS is is a huge deal. Well, especially in the US where this podcast is targeted towards, uh, it's still that Apple factor, it's still that iMessage factor. It's freaking blue circles versus green circles. Uh, and, um, you know, there, there's a lot that we could um, dissect from that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I I wish that Google had just sort of done its own like version of iMessage. I, I I would prefer that they just like stuck with like Hangouts and made it like more integrated. But uh, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to do something that was like an open standard, I guess, which seems kind of pointless because the I mean, the only other platform of note is iPhone and they have iMessage on that. They're never going to support RCS. They have no reason to do that. I'm generally against the cloistering of uh, messaging called uh, protocols and all that stuff. So anyone that supports a more open global uh, protocol would be my jam. But uh, then again, you don't have the marketing cachet or the the, the emotional attachment to it. I guess yeah, it's uh, weird. Yeah, I mean, the thing about uh, that is unfortunate about RCS, though, is that, I mean, it is somebody else is in control of, of your messaging, what if, whether it's Google or carriers, there's no end-to-end -end encryption on that like there is on, for example, like iMessage or, you know, any of the third-party messaging apps or most of them. You know, you can turn on encryption so that, you know, nobody could see what you're doing. Um, but, yeah, I mean, RCS is, is more out in the open, but it is a standard. It's just, you know, when you only have these two platforms, I mean, it, RCS is functionally locked to Android. I mean, it, it, it just would have been easier if Google had done its own thing from, from the get-go. Then we wouldn't be dealing with all this carrier nonsense. Yeah, fair enough. But we'll always bring up ISIS as uh, one of those <laughs> things where, yeah. you know, you want to avoid that at all costs, please. Yeah, right. I mean, th thankfully, that crashed and burned. That was a uh, that was that was a dark time for anybody who doesn't remember back then, when you couldn't even get Google Wallet, which is what we now have. You know, we now know as Google Pay. You couldn't even get that on most carriers because the carriers wanted to give you a SIM card that had like a different NFC chip in it, so all of your payments would go through them. And everyone, like the retailers, were just all like up in themselves as well because you couldn't use it at CVS for the longest time. One of the big stalwarts, they had their own, um, what was it, the MCX or something, Merchants Consumer Alliance thing, and the current that thing scene. With, like the, Q the QR codes that was really stupidly. Oh confusing. boy, oh boy, we could rail on and on about this forever, but I feel like we should transition over from something that is a. Uh, crash and burn into a slow descent. I feel like that that should be your job, <laughs> I Ryan. Know, I don't know if it's it's really slow, but I mean, uh, so like wear, wearables are, are hard to, to make unless you are Apple, apparently. Um, so <laughs> Google has had a lot of problems with Wear OS. I think we all know that. We've talked about it a lot, but uh, apparently they might be changing up their wearable strategy according to a new report uh, Google is talking to Fitbit about acquiring the company. 
Uh, you might have heard a couple of weeks ago, Fitbit was rumored to put itself up for sale. And now apparently Google is, is you know, thinking about buying that. And presumably if Google does buy that, I mean, that would signal a pretty big shift in the way Google does wearables because right now it just makes Wear OS and other companies make the hardware. And right now those other companies are basically limited to Fossil. And, and Fitbit like makes its own yeah. hardware, so. Yeah, there'd be no reason to buy Fitbit if you weren't gonna make the hardware. Like their software is not impressive, except I mean, they, their exercise tracking algorithms are but I mean, you can, you, why, you're not gonna buy the whole company if all you want is that. Pixel Watch 2020, I mean, that's the I mean, big uh, talk point. That would, be, that would be nice. I mean, Google, I feel, has, has held off on that for so long because they were hoping that their OEM partners would be able to, to sort of push Wear OS to success in the same way they did Android. But when you look at how many companies have just dropped out of Wear OS, I think that's very clear. It, it's not gonna work this time. Um, the, the hardware is just not there to make uh, sort of a, a, you know, a more open platform work for wearables. That's why the Apple Watch is so good is that, you know, Apple has control over the entire process, the hardware and the software, and it's optimized extremely well, whereas Wear OS is a laggy mess. Yeah. And uh, everyone else is bringing uh, E-Ink stuff. I, I mean, Fitbit has the Pebble uh, IP. Um, do you think there's a potential that Google's mining that little kernel going in there? Um, I mean, I don't think at this point that uh, it's been a couple of years since Pebble really did anything interesting. I don't think that there's that much useful stuff still in there. Um, I mean, it really feels like Fitbit didn't use a whole lot of, of Pebble's technology either. Um, they might not have gotten a whole lot out of that out, that acquisition um, because you know the Ionic and the Versa they really just feel like slightly more capable Fitbit fitness trackers. Fitbit fit, Fitbit OS one point one I would feel like. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I I uh, I liked the well, I didn't like the Fitbit watches when they they first came out, but after a couple of months, they'd made a number of of pretty good changes, and I thought they were on a good uh, sort of trajectory. Um, and the Versa was a better watch than the Ionic, but then, I mean, it, it seems like they've sort of, you know, tapered off the innovation. There's still a lot of problems with Fitbit OS, and um, yeah, you know, and, and apparently Fitbit as a company is not doing as well, which is why they're looking, you know, for for a sale. Um, for them, it's about the Uber equation. For them, it's always about growth, and uh, I'm not sure. Like, there's so much data involved that they could mind that investors just haven't been, um, you know, liking what they have seen in terms of using it because. Yeah. I mean, there, there's really, there's only so much growth in, in the, the niche that Fitbit is trying to fill. Like they're stuck between the Apple watch that costs, you know, a hundred and 150, $200 more and is the, like the best watch for, for iPhone owners. And then, like below them, they have all of the like the budget fitness tracking things like uh, like Xiaomi and Amazbit. And then they also have like if they try to focus mainly on the fitness stuff, they have Garmin, which is a smaller player, but still is really popular with people who are, you know, runners and athletes. Uh, so it's like I don't see where they can really go with the strategy they've been following thus far. They might think that they need to cash out before the company's value declines like Pebble did. Hmm. See, I mean, you know, I don't want to see it as a running towards a dead end kind of thing because, you know, just as just because Google is in the field and it's kind of a easy way out for them to, if, for lack of a better term, is... Um, somewhat cynical i don't know but yeah, it's i mean like... that that might be the nature of wearables i mean it, it's basically like the apple watch is the best smartwatch, and then everything else is like it it either sucks or it's like Dog okay chill. if it's okay like if you need a smartwatch for x yeah well we're gonna have to see about that as uh, developments move forward but in the meantime we're still developing ourselves here at android police and uh, we can't be here without you we're live four times a week on twitch that's a crazy amount of live content and we can't do it without your support so you can help us by subscribing 
to Android Police on Twitch. So think of the perks that you can get from all of this. You get a special emoji of Ryan. Ryan just losing his mind, cracking up, and going all nuts. Uh, you could also get extra entries into AP's giveaway, giveaways. Give, give, giveries? Give, give, giveaways. Yes. This is what happens when uh, you listen to yourself so often and uh, you have a little delay in your headphones. Tiers start at $5 a month, but you can also subscribe to us for free if you have an Amazon Prime account. You pay nothing, but Amazon gives us money, although you have to resubscribe to us every month. You can learn more about all that at twitch.tv slash Android Police. Thank you very much. All right. So you know how I could go back into that ad and wish that I could remove the part where I stuttered about giveaways and somehow maybe, you know, change that so that whatever Twitch algorithms are learning about our broadcast might not take that up. Getting somewhere. You believe me. All right. So we're talking about Google Assistant here and how it is starting to uh, implement another way for you to get editing uh, into your queries. So if Google Assistant recognizes some words that you have said in the incorrect way, you can tap on your query and then tap edit and then just keyboard in whatever you originally intended to say. Now, yeah, so th this is different than the editing you've always been able to do to assisting queries. You know, you can you can long press and edit, you know, and, and get the text of, of what you said and change it as necessary. This is Google sort of proactively guessing that it misheard you and it, it will underline the part of, of the query that it thinks it got wrong. And you can just tap on that to edit it real quickly. Um, and that will sort of feed back into the algorithm and, and make it better at not missing those words next time, um, which I think is, I, I think that could be really useful. Um, and I wonder if there's, even if you don't edit it, I wonder if it knows to like listen for that, for that sort of phrase and, and sort of mark it as, as, as something it needs to analyze further. Um, but uh, you can at least manually change it, and that should help it understand. So if you like, um, if you have multiple people in your contacts that have like similar names, and Google often uh, misunderstands, you know, which name you said, you can you can go in and like just tap the edit. It'll hopefully it'll underline it, and you can say, no, I meant this. And then hopefully the next time you you know try to use that contact's name, it'll get the right one. I mean, I'd rather not. I'd rather have it get it correct in the first place because <laughs> I mean that would be that would be great. But I mean, I felt I feel like uh, assistant is usually pretty good at understanding like unusual names and phrases. Um, at yeah. least it's it's a lot better than than Alexa is, uh, or yeah. I would assume Siri. I don't use an iPhone, but I, I don't I don't hear people praising how great it is for things <laughs> like that. Um, but you know it it but you know this is something I don't think I've seen it on any of my phones yet. It's just, you know, it's like many Google things. It's something that is being tested. It'll probably roll out to more people at some point. It might become a thing on all phones eventually. We just, we can't say for sure because this is just the way Google rolls these days. And uh, you also have continued conversation to, you know, let Google Assistant listen in on like a few more seconds of uh, your frustration. And, uh, you know, it can say sorry afterwards. Like it yeah, does, when you usually. when you when you swear at that assistant after it gets something stupidly wrong, it's like, oops, sorry. Do you want to send feedback? Nope, that just upset me <laughs> more. Google. Nope, I'm mad at you. Don't yeah. let me get more mad. <laughs> All right. Uh, I hope there is uh, very little to get mad about when you're going uh, trick or treating, or if you're a host family giving out candy. Um, are you doing that, Ryan, this uh, year? I believe we are. Yeah, we just we just moved to a new neighborhood, so we don't we don't want to be those people who don't give out candy. So uh, get to know yeah. the neighbors. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so uh, and and the trick or treaters will have a nice little surprise when they they press our our doorbell. Um, we have a nest hello, and um, 
apparently, you know, that this is the new thing they're doing is seasonal themes. So they rolled out the first one just in time for Halloween. It's spooky sounds. So um, we have we have an article on the website with a video demoing the uh, the rings that you get. It there it's it's pretty good. Everybody everybody who's like pressed the doorbell so far, they like Amazon delivery people mostly. They seem pleasantly surprised. Um, so instead of the regular ding dong sound, it has like a more ominous kind of gong. And then there are like sounds like, you know, witch cackles and Frankenstein groans. And I'm pretty sure they added a new one just recently because I, somebody rang the doorbell earlier and there was like a ghost sound afterwards, like a like spooky woo ghost sound. And I'm pretty sure that didn't exist before. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, we have a clip. We, we can play that right now. So it's fun, right? Yeah, you got all the thunder and lightning and uh, whatnot, and um, monsters, witches, yeah. witches brew. I think, I think this is like uh, this is pretty clever marketing, actually, uh, for Nest because people are people are going to you know they're going to be delighted by this, and they're going to be like, I wonder what that doorbell is. I should I should find find out and maybe buy one. Um, and uh, uh, so the you know this isn't just a Halloween thing; it's their seasonal theme. So I assume there will be many more uh, i bet christmas will have a lot of them uh that that's probably a thing so look forward yeah. to that in the next couple couple of months look forward to that indeed all right so we're going to take a break here because uh i've been in contact with nick gray our guest for a little bit now and it, the reason why he's actually late is because uh he ran into a car accident while picking up the girls from school so um that was, you know, a little unfortunate, but he's able to do it right now. And um, hopefully, you know, not too many nerves were frayed. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll give, give him a little time to get acclimated. He's in the room right now or in the podcast document. Um, so uh, we'll just, uh, you know, settle down. Maybe get a little tea. If if any if if uh, anybody has questions about anything in in the the Android world, now would be a good time to ask them. I would way. yeah. Let's get that Q and A stacked up, please. Especially um you know Nick Gray, he's been traveling around the country. Ask him what phones he has been using all across uh, then for the past like eighteen months or so, uh, and um, other things too. Let me see if. Uh, I have to give permission for him to get in there because uh, sometimes ask a weird thing. See, here's the problem with Judy Sweets. And, oh, there we go. Boom. Right in there. Now. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Sorry for my tardiness. No problem, no problem, especially after uh, what you've been through just now. I have uh, updated our audience on the situation that you've been through. And uh, yeah, it's no... been a fun afternoon. <laughs> I can tell. I can tell. Okay. Well, so we can, um, we can, I guess we can proceed with the, the second half of the show as planned. Yeah, yeah. So you don't have to worry about all the news stories um, that uh, we just been through. Um, we're just asking about you at this point because, let's face it, you're a pretty interesting guy to be talking. Oh, sure, to. I am. <laughs> well, yeah. you've just come off of a one heck of a adventure in the past year and a half or so. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole Gray family has crisscrossed the country, stopping at waterfalls, lakes, forests, deserts. Plenty of campgrounds, fireworks in the middle of all that. Nick decided to take on a big challenge, buying up and running one of the original Android fan blogs around, that is Fandroid. And we're happy to hang out and chat with him and about pretty much everything that's happened in the past year or so. Uh, welcome, Nick. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I've been on a lot of podcasts with you, but this is the first time I'm on this podcast. <laughs> well, I'm glad to be... Uh working with you on this one or working with everyone on this one. Yeah. So Nick, I, why don't you, if, for people who don't know, just uh, maybe explain real quick, you know, what, what you, what you were doing in an RV for a year and a half. 
Uh, well, there's a lot to it. Um, so for those who don't know, I was living over in Italy uh, before we started our RV adventure and my parents were still living over there. And unfortunately they passed away in a house fire. And so we kind of put everything on hold in our lives, trying to figure out, hey, what are we gonna do? Uh, Cause they kind of threw everything up in the air as far as living in Italy and then deciding on coming back to the States. We were, uh, my wife and I had met in Minnesota. We lived there for about a decade before going to Italy. And we said, do we really wanna go back to Minnesota? It's freaking cold up there. So we uh, kind of put things into perspective that way of where do we want to be and she's always been about minimal li minimal living and tiny houses things like that and she had this idea of hey why don't we buy an rv and just travel the country for a year and we thought we had this original idea and then we started looking into it and apparently there are over 1 million americans who own rvs and live full time in an rv traveling the country all the time and I uh, got a lot of inspiration from them. When we got back to the States, we bought a travel trailer, did about three and a half months of renovation on a travel trailer to make it look not like an RV on the inside because they are dark and gloomy. And um, yeah, and so we, we made it look our own and hit the road and had a thousand and one adventures in about 16 months. Mm -hmm. I, I can't fault you for not wanting to uh, live through another Minnesota winter. I can say that as, <laughs> as a Minnesotan, by the way. Oh, yeah? Are, do you still live there? Or? I do. I do. Yeah. We're about... Uh, Woodbury, Twin Cities. Woodbury. Yeah, Twin Cities. Yeah, we were over in St. Paul. I, I lived in St. Paul for like 11 years. Yeah. We still miss it. It's a still gr a great area, but, you know, it's... It is, uh, but those it's winters very, come very, early very and they cold. stay long. Yeah, I'm expecting snow in a few days. Of course, but <laughs> but so so I mean, your experience in an RV is probably a lot different than most people because you know you're you're running a technology blog. Like you need to be connected constantly. Also, you have kids, and if you don't have like internet to entertain them, I imagine it's a lot worse. Yeah, exactly. I mean, so technology and RVs have been mixing for years. I mean, they. They've had antennas on the top of RVs that you actually have a crank to crank up the antenna so it stands up tall uh, when you're parked so that you're not hitting bridges and stuff when you're driving around. Uh, a lot of RVs have satellite setups. And some of the newer ones actually come with built-in uh, 4G boosters. Airstream is selling uh, Air, uh, Airstreams that have a built-in uh, 4G antenna booster with an antenna on the outside and then repeats the signal on the inside. Uh, so we did a combination of things to make sure that we were connected all the time. We got a WeBoost uh, through my connections, through you know, all the technology stuff that we do, which does the same thing, and then managed to pick up a kind of a bootleg hotspot line through Verizon, which uh, gave us literally unlimited hotspot for about 20 yeah. bucks a month. I, I found that pretty interesting. So is that, so is that basically like a line that somebody bought like eight years ago and has and it's just been like passed from person to person and so there there are some of those so it it was honestly so there are those you know truly unlimited lines from years in the past and then this one here was kind of a deprecated business line so a company that had you know 300 employees and they were on a corporate account and then when the company went out of business the company scooped in and purchased their lines so kind of the same deal but it was a corporate version so it was actually cheaper than some of those other unlimited lines because those original unlimited lines were like 50 to 60 bucks a month and this one was only 20. so i still have this verizon line with me and when we moved into our house once we started stop traveling full time we we used it for about a month and a half in our house before i got gigabit internet installed because you know 20 bucks a month for you know verizon unlimited internet can't be beat yeah you, that's the you know, i would keep paying for that forever yeah exactly i would not want to risk losing that sort of deal that's that's pretty good yeah so it, it, internet on the road was tough i mean a lot of campgrounds claim they have wi-fi uh, if you can <laughs> call it that but it's honestly typically it's a standard home wi-fi network that they've set up for 40 to 50 rvers to use all at the same time so you can imagine you know quarter meg downloads and practical practically impossible uploads 
Uh, so going the the Verizon uh, route was the best, and then we supplemented with our regular T-Mobile line. So between the two, we pretty much had coverage everywhere we went, except for a couple places close to you know the desert, Nevada, things like that, where you're out in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Okay, I have kind of an inside baseball question. So sure. I, I mean, I get like shipments of review units probably weekly. Uh, how do you get how do you get like packages when you're <laughs> that that was a tricky one so for for those who don't know a lot of people who travel full time in an rv they actually have a fake address typically in florida or uh, montana or something like that some of the states that actually don't uh, have uh, state income tax so that at the end of the year you don't have to pay as much taxes as you do in most states uh, but one of the reasons you do that as well is that you set up a mail forwarding service with that. Uh, and it acts like a regular mailbox and you can get packages sent to you and things like that. But that really doesn't work for what we do, you're getting the, these review devices once a week. So anytime I was in contact with somebody saying, hey, when's this device coming? I always have to say, is it going to arrive Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday? Because I need to know exactly when it's coming because then I'll give you the appropriate camping ad camping mail address. <laughs> to the campground that we're gonna be staying at. Or sometimes it was, a lot of times if you're camping in state parks or national parks, you cannot have mail forwarded to you. Uh, so then I have to say, yes, I want my review unit, but you must send it out in exactly 12 days to this specific address. And sometimes the campgrounds, that if you have a reservation, they'll hold it for you for like a week before you get there. So that wasn't ever an issue, but it was a little bit harder than usual to get review devices while I was on the road. Yeah, I, I bet I bet the next few years are going to be just filled with PR people asking, are you still at campsite 13 in, <laughs> yeah. in the state park? Nope. No, that was well, and, no, I was just there for five days. <laughs> because usually for those of us who work with the regular PR people in and out, they, they have our addresses on file and they say, should I send it to the same address? And you say yes. And my regular response was, yes, send me this, but this is the updated address with every email. And I had to make sure I'd have to go to the campground office to make sure, can we, you, will you accept the mail for me, a FedEx package or a UPS package, something like that. So, so tell us about, uh, so you were, you were formerly at Android and me and HTC source, and then you decided to, uh, to buy Fandroid and run that. So why, mm -hmm. why, why do that? Uh, well, I mean, I, I started HTC source, uh, before Apple invented the smartphone. I, I, I started a smartphone blog before the smartphone was invented. Uh, and it's always been a part of me. I mean, it, it was 2006, 2007 before it was, you know, really up and running. Uh, and it's always been a part of me. I've been to CES over a dozen times at this point. I've been to Mobile World Congress so many times. It's 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 something that I really love, and it's a passion of mine. And when I was working at Android and Me under under Taylor, and you know, just the organization that he had put together at the time uh, before he sold and moved on to the PR world, the dark side. Uh, it, it was always something that I really, really enjoyed. And having worked for Rob uh, when Fandred was still running, uh, I, I knew the site, I knew the organization that was around it. And then when he decided to shut things down, when he originally didn't find a buyer, uh, it, it kind of hurt me, you know, having worked for an organization that produced really good content. And, uh, you know, it was part of the history of Android news. I mean, Fandroid was registered within 24 hours of Google announcing Android. So it, like it, it, it was one day older, one day newer than the official announcement of Android itself. So uh, I just felt like something had to be done to keep it alive. And we're, we're trying to get things back to where they were. It's going to be a while because the shite was literally shut down for nine months. And a lot of our regular readers moved on to, to you guys, to uh, dozens of other sites that are out there that are covering the same thing. And, uh, you know, rebuilding an audience is tough, but hey, we're here to have fun and uh, make some adventures along the way, right? Yes, we're, we're, we're happy. We're happy to have the competition. It makes all of us better, I hope. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like a, a lot of people think with all the Android sites that are out there that we're extremely competitive and, you know, everyone's, you know, cutthroat. 
But if you go to any of the events, the people who are actually hanging out with each other are, you know, not the, we hang out with everybody, but like if you go to CES or Mobile World Congress, we tend to gravitate towards more of the other people who are doing exactly the same thing as us. So Android news sites hang out with Android news sites and, you know, we share this collective bond in, in what we're doing. And yes, there's competition, but I, I think there's camaraderie there as well. Yeah, there, there's really no place else you can go and uh, and know that if you say some obscure thing about Android from eight years ago, that everybody around you is going to know what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're we're happy that Fandroid is still around. I I I mean, I remember reading Fandroid religiously back in like you know 2008 and 2009. Uh, so I'm I'm happy I'm happy it's still around, and I'm happy that somebody who cares about it and cares about Android as like a thing is is running it. Yeah. So, I mean, as far as getting things back off the ground again, uh, we started off back in essentially January 1st, right before CES uh, made the announcement that, you know, hey, we're, we're live again. Uh, but now uh, within this past year, we're, we're trying to regrow the audience and get traffic back up, uh, grow the YouTube channel as well. Uh, and then this year at C or this coming year at CES, we're hoping to have a, a team of three to four of us on the ground to help cover CES rather than just me because I've covered CES on my own multiple times and it's never fun. So I was like, hey, we can actually have four people there this year and not drive myself insane. Yeah, yeah, CES is a big, big show. If for anybody who hasn't been there, it basically takes over every convention center space in the city and it is it is uh, giant. It is a mess to get anywhere and do anything. Yeah. Well, and while there's not a whole lot of big Android announcements, there's always more than enough for a lot of new news coverage for that week. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of Android adjacent stuff going yeah. on. Android adjacent accessories that you'll be interested in and, you know, Android TV stuff. You know, there, there's always something. And, you know, even if there isn't a whole lot of news that comes out of it, it's, you know, the networking that you have to do with the PR companies and people in the industry in order to maintain access to get review units and things like that throughout the year. So uh, even though it might not be the, the biggest news event for us, typically Mobile World Congress is, uh, it's definitely one of the most important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Well, um, I think we're, we're kind of coming toward the, the end of the show here. Um, if anybody's asked any questions in the, uh, in the chat room, I haven't been watching, or if anybody has any questions now about, about the stuff that Nick is up to, uh, now would be a time to, to ask those questions. Yeah, I haven't seen any real well relevant questions going on here, but uh, if you have, or you probably already hit up Missouri a few times because that's where one of our fans, Andrew Wallace, Fat Produce, uh, says that uh, Missouri, less cold, still has that same Midwest friendliness. Uh, I would, it would say I would say a lot less cold. It, that place is it's like basically tropical during the summer. It's like the wettest place I've ever been. <laughs> yeah, except they do get their ice storms there. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do. Um, so, what are your plans for the future, both for Fandroid and yourself? Uh, well, for those who don't know, now I'm settled down. We purchased the house in the Cleveland area. And it's been a couple months now that that's happened. Our, our family's getting settled in. Actually went out uh, car shopping uh, last week to, to find a replacement for our big, massive truck that we don't need anymore because we don't have an RV to tow around. 12 miles to the gallon in the city is not ideal for day-to-day -day life. Uh, but yeah, just settling back into a regular routine, getting an office set up in a, you know, a little studio for recording videos. And um, it, it sounds like the mundane stuff in life, but it's uh, completely different once you've been living in you and your family in 180 square feet for 16 months. Just having an office where you can close the door and say, get out, I'm on a podcast. Yeah. Couldn't and do that before. You have, you have two kids, right? Yeah, we have two kids and, uh, and a little puppy. That is, uh, that is, that's, that's, that sounds rough to me, but. <laughs> well, and so here's the thing. Like, we thought we were crazy when we did this. And then we hit the road. And there's a community called Full-Time Families of families with children who are fa traveling full-time. And they have over a 1,000 paying members to this group. 
and we had, we went to three different meetups uh, with them and 50 families show up and we're like, okay, so everyone's gonna have one to two kids. There were families with four to six to eight children oh, in their RVs and they've been on the road for like four to five years. And I'm like, man, I thought I was crazy. There's, there's always a level higher than you. I mean, <laughs> but they had been on the road for so long. And a lot of these people, like some people did it by choice, like they, for economic reasons, you know, they couldn't afford to live in a house anymore. So living in an RV was cheaper and they decided to travel rather than sit in an RV park somewhere. But uh, quite a few of them, we met, I, we met so many people that are working for Fortune 500 companies, working remotely, making, you know, six figures a year, high six figures. And that's just what they choose to do. A lot of them, actually, the, the husband would travel every other week. He would go and, you know, the, his secretary would book him a flight out of a different city every week and travel three days uh, and just like a regular corporate job, right? And but they were just doing it from the road, and you know, hey, I'm at a national park this week instead of you know being stuck in Minnesota for the winter. Yeah. So, do you think you're gonna are you gonna stay put for a while then, or or you think an RV is in your future? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we're gonna be staying put, uh, but we're actually thinking about our house as more of a home base rather than our house. Uh, so we did sell our travel trailer about a month and a half ago, right before IFA. Uh, it was a uh, tough decision to sell it after putting in so much work to renovate it. But then um, we still have that travel bug. I mean, after after you've traveled so long, sitting still it just seems monotonous. And so we're we're actually talking about what do we do next. Um, my wife really wants to buy a Sprinter van and finish that out. Uh, and, you know, make just enough room for beds for the kids and us and, you know, being able to travel without having a tow vehicle because towing a trailer behind you is really nerve wracking at times. Uh, so living the hashtag van life and, and doing that. Um, and, you know, we, we don't know what's going to play out. Uh, it, it's an option. My idea is actually to buy a smaller, older uh, Airstream, like a 1970s or a 1980s Airstream, and gut it on the inside and you know document the whole remodel process and do that. But uh, we'll, we'll figure it out once we get there. For Love now. The <laughs> yes, go okay. ahead. No, for now, it's uh, just trying to find a, a replacement for our truck so that we don't waste our money driving the girls to school every other day and then figuring it out probably in the next year or two if 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 we actually continue on this crazy adventure that we started. Well, it sounds like the gray adventures will continue on for the time being, at least. That, that's the hope, yeah. Yeah, well, the hope lives on in all of us, I guess. So feel free to connect with us anytime. We're live four times a week on twitch.tv slash Android Police. All the stories we've talked about today can be found at androidpolice.com slash podcast. And you can send your thoughts and suggestions. And we are very open to them. Podcast at androidpolice.com. Nick, your time to shine. Where are you at? You can find me uh, personally, uh, at Nick M. Gray on Twitter and Instagram, uh, or else follow everything Fandroid at P-H-A-N-P-R-O-I-D dot com. Uh, also fa at Fandroid on Twitter and Instagram as well, if we decide to update Instagram, because, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, we don't that often. <laughs> yeah, every, everybody should go to Fandroid after you go to Android Police. Yeah. Sooner or later, it's going to be yes. Android Police. I don't know. Yeah, Perhaps that might be a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, as for the rest of us uh, on Twitter, I'm at Ryan Whitwam. Our producer Jules Wang is at Point Jules. The theme music for our podcast is by Home. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday with another show, and until then, enjoy your week. And we are clear.